Uh, hi, welcome to Culture Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen Wade, and my guest today is Leah Finnegan. Uh, Leah, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Leah, the executive editor of The Outline and the author of a, a Quattro yearly newsletter, Leah Letter. This is my dog, Baby. <laughs> uh, so, Leah and Baby, thank you for coming on today. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the pieces you've written in the past couple months or year or so that I thought were uh, especially interesting. But yeah, I subscribe to Leah Letter and I encourage other people to. Is it really only, it's only coming out quarterly at this point? Uh, yeah, that's about, um, I, I need about six weeks now to germinate a piece and then, you know, two weeks of intense, uh, excruciating pain thinking about writing it, <laughs> one to two days of writing it, and then the cycle starts again. Right. Yeah, that, make, that, that makes sense. Um, and, and congratulations. You, I guess you fairly recently started uh, as executive editor of, of The Outline? Uh, at the end of last year, yeah. Okay, cool. And everyone should check out um, The Outline. I think it's a really interesting site. Um, so the, the, the piece that made me uh, think I uh, really wanted to get you on the program was uh, this one uh, titled, uh, quote, Be Yourself is Terrible Advice. And we'll we'll provide a link to this and the other pieces we discuss below. Um, and yeah, I just thought this was <laughs> this was a really interesting idea, and one I hadn't consider considered before. So I guess kind of can you start with talking about before you came to this realization about being yourself uh, being a bad idea, like how you were acting in the world. Sure, I mean, like anyone. Uh, going through their post uh, teenage years and figuring out who they were, you know that it's a, it's a very interesting journey. And um, I think like there's this emphasis for my generation, which I guess is the millennial generation, especially that we should, you know, follow our passions, do what we want, be ourselves, uh, you know, go to a really expensive four year college, no matter how much it costs, take out a lot of money to do that. And, like, it's all about you, like, following your truth, no matter what consequences may come of that. And so my conclusion was, you know, more philosophical that in order to succeed in the world, both with relationships and with work, I couldn't actually be who I thought I was. Because that might feel right to me, but being alive is about relationships and modifying your own personality to maintain those relationships. Right. And so you, you were writing for Gawker at this point. Uh -huh. um, and you talk about like um, live blogging, a meeting that you were having with yeah. your boss and writing things that weren't flattering sure. about your boss or something like that. Sure. And doing, and, and also things in your personal life that you were, I don't know, like, were you like kind of, telling it like it is like that was the the idea that you had like you know if you, if you have the thought and you think it's the truth then you might as well say it right yeah yeah I mean it's a very like it's a very Trumpian type of logic it's like no filter I'm gonna say what I want to say uh no matter if it completely offends people and maybe even repels them uh and working at a site like Gawker that was like a kind of a hot pot that really uh let that kind of attitude bloom and uh, fester. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it, it's interesting calling it Trumpian. Like, yeah, you know, you often hear, like, if they're interviewing a man on the street or something who supports Trump, they'll say, so, someone would say, like, you know, he really tells it like it is. Right. Um, and, you know, I guess, and, like, Gawker, uh, which I was never, like, a loyal reader of, but would read articles that, you know, became popular, um, you know, also was like dedicated to saying the things that the old MSM wouldn't say because maybe they would be embarrassing to someone in power or, right. or talking about like open secrets in the media or uh, world or government or, or New York City or something that, you know, everyone sort of knew, but you couldn't tell the like normal people and then they would just, they would just say it. Um, and then, you know, as, as we all know, tr um, since 2016, uh, Trump has become president and Gawker went out of business. Um, so I don't know what to make, make of that. Uh, maybe you can, you know, in a world where there are like libel laws, um, 
it can be exploited by someone like um, oh, what's that? What's the guy's name who's, who was the mastermind of the lawsuit? Um, uh, Peter Thiel. Yeah, Peter Thiel, the uh, libertarian billionaire who masterminded the lawsuit about Hulk Hogan's sex tape, um, and <laughs> so that shuttered Gawker, although it morphed into a, a, a various other sites. I guess it mainly called Splinter, but anyway, but yeah, but like Trump has, has like succeeded not wildly. He is president, but he's not super popular. And so, okay, so I'm kind of rambling, but is there, was there something about 2016 in particular, uh, that traumatic year for people left of center that made you realize like you didn't want to be this type of person anymore? Uh, I don't think it was that. Um, I don't think it was like a global, any global uh, event that really spurred this. But I actually think it was kind of a rejection. I mean, this kind of goes into what I read about irony but who I wanted to be kind of like the kind of person I was, was now like how the entire world was like, you know, I've always been a depressed person. And then after Trump won, like everyone was depressed and I was like, Oh, I should try to be happy now. Cause I'm really <laughs> like, that's going to be my project. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's how I kind of came to this, uh, Zen like realization after uh, some deep self examination. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what is, um, you know, like there's a lot of things in the culture that tell us to be yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, when I was reading your piece, I was reminded of the um, Polonius's speech to Laertes in Hamlet, where he says, To thy own self be true. And that's mm-hmm. like one of the most famous quotes in Shakespeare. Okay. And there's people, you know, it's not clear whether that speech and that advice he gives is supposed to be ironic like taken at, at face value or whether it's like bad advice because he tells him not to lend money when Shakespeare himself was a money lender so that's a little ambivalent but um but it does like I I got my mom a magnet from when I my wife and I went to um the Shakespeare Museum or whatever in Stratford that said to thy own self be true and she has that magnet on her fridge right now um so, so that's like a core idea and then pre- yeah pretty much every I don't know like every mainstream movie it's like the, the core message is like, you just need to learn how to be yourself and then good things will happen or like, you know. Very, like, it's a very like common theme in feminism now, like to be empowered, to be like heard is to be yourself. But maybe uh, that's kind of like, it doesn't encourage a lot of nuance, which I think is, you know, basically the problem with the entire world. But <laughs> yeah and that reminds me there was there was an article i'm pretty sure amanda marcott was the author it came out around 2015 or so and there was some kind of news story about like a women's college sports team like causing havoc at a hotel or something and doing like kind of frat like traditional frat boy behavior and she was saying like this is a good thing like women you know women can express themselves in the way that the patriarchy has allowed men to express themselves for uh, right. millennia and i was thinking like well shouldn't we try to be trying to say like to the frat boy men like stop acting like assholes instead of right. saying oh women can act like assholes too now right. and we'll be we'll be fine right. with that so right. um but yeah there is definitely that strand of you know i mean that's the kind of thing like you may have that opinion and you may think you're being yourself by expressing it but in order to actually like approach the world and interact with the world in a productive manner, like don't say it, don't say it out loud. Like maybe just tell a friend. Yeah. And that's one of your themes, repeated themes in your work is the idea of like, just not, don't say it, be quiet. Don't, you know, um, don't tweet, tweet out whatever you're going to. um, And and that'll be better. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the role that you're uh, getting a dog played in in this, because you talk about that for a little in the yeah, in the yeah, and you know, I have a, I'm very like self conscious of becoming a dog person, but I guess you know that's what I've done, and I have to accept it. <laughs> uh, so I, I have been thinking about getting a dog for a while, and I told my therapist that I was thinking about it, and he's like, "That's the best idea you've ever had. Like, you get a dog, like you go outside more, like you interact with the world more. People who have dogs live longer." Uh, and I was like, oh, like, you've never thought I had a good idea. So like, <laughs> I have to get a dog. And uh, I think it really is uh, like a good thing for a, an, an introvert like me to have because 
if I don't have a reason to leave the house, like I probably wouldn't because like, why would I ever leave? It's so nice here. Uh, but at the same time, that's like the worst thing you can do because then you just are like, why am I so lonely? And it's like, oh, I haven't left the house in, in five days. Mm-hmm. So a dog, uh, you know, by nature of their uh, bathroom habits makes that kind of behavior impossible which I found to be good for my own uh, disposition. Yeah. And they're, funny and they're cute. Yeah. And your, your dog is, is, is Instagram famous or Instagram semi-famous, I guess. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm really trying to keep her low key. Like, okay. uh, like I don't want to have an Instagram celebrity dog. Like, I just don't want to do that. She's, she's much too dignified for that <laughs> even though she's the least dignified animal on the planet <laughs> um and it, what is she what kind of dog is she i'm sure you get asked that a thousand times she's a brussels griffin oh okay so, yeah it's a it's a belgian breed and they were used to catch rats in stables in the 18th century but she has no talent for that <laughs> um okay i think I've, i just came up with a possible segue to the next okay. topic which mm-hmm. is, um, you know, dogs are like, like a dog can't be ironic. I don't think like a dog is sincere in, in right. everything it does. Right. And there's also a growing kind of online like community or persona or something based around dogs, loving dogs, posting pictures of dogs, rating dogs and and the guy who created this uh, Twitter account, which has since become like a multimedia empire called we rate dogs. Uh uh, He essentially just posts uh, cute pictures of dogs and um, you know, gives them a joke rating. It's always, it's always out of 10. So usually they get 12 out of 10 Mm -hmm. and he created all these or either created or, (laughs) you know, appropriated all these words like doggo and pupper Mm -hmm. and all these other things uh, you know about how dogs are <laughs> cute and adorable and so you see there's like a backlash to this online from some of the like irony types especially on twitter where you see people making fun of this and being like you know this guy makes me want to you know stick a, a knife in my eye or something but um but i feel like if you do have a dog or ever ever loved a dog like you kind of get it and you move past the level of irony where uh into just being like yeah this dog is great this dog is amazing <laughs> um yeah so but you you wrote a piece that this came out in the middle of last year um the headline is bring back irony it's the only antidote to our all too earnest age Mm -hmm. um but you but it's not exactly irony you want well okay so you you talk about how it's not that irony has gone away is that something else has a kind of um you know monster has been created between earnestness (laughs) <laughs> earnestness and irony which you call ur- urgent earnestness or earn uh-huh. um and yeah that this weird beast has like taken over so can you talk a little bit about that idea sure um i mean most of my recent work kind of stems from the fact that i i read a lot of kierkegaard at some point last year so he's kind of a a constant theme there, but he really, um, his theory of irony was that it was just a form of distance from whatever was happening, whether, you know, in, in the, in public life and private life. And you would take that distance to kind of analyze what was happening and not be so quick to, uh, issue like a snap judgment. Uh, and like, the internet is basically the inverse of that. And it's just encouraging uh, opinions at like a, a a rapid pace. And it's kind of like, like I don't use Twitter anymore, except sometimes to like spy on my employees and see if they're tweeting about me. Um, <laughs> I do want to talk about that, about getting off of Twitter, sure. your, your choice to do that, but we'll touch that later. <laughs> and, um, but I'll go on now and like, you'll go to one person's profile and they'll be like, North Korea, we're not doing the right thing. Cheeseburgers are awesome. Puppies, I love, look at this gif of a puppy. Syria, we need to intervene. And it's like, how can one person like have that many like, you know, opinions like on every single subject? And it's like, I, you know, my personality unfortunately comes across as being sort of a know-it-all. But I like to approach most things as if I know nothing, because it's true. I don't know anything really at all. 
uh, you know, I don't know what we should do about North Korea. I don't know uh, if cheeseburgers are the best. <laughs> like, uh, that there's no um, like impar- impetus for uh, like curiosity and learning because everyone just wants to be an expert on everything. And I think that's uh, where this philosophical irony comes in because there's just no space between us and whatever is happening. Um, yeah, and you, uh, yeah, you, so you, just on Kierkegaard, you mentioned you, Kierkegaard in the, in the previous essay we discussed. Um, so, and I noted that, and it made me think of, well, there's a well known Twitter account that mocks Kierkegaard combined with Kim Kardashian called Kim Kierkegaard Dashian. Right. And, um, and they recently published a book in the last year or so. And so, the, the, if you've never seen this, they combine quotes uh, from Kierkegaard that are about, like, you know, the, Dark Night of the Soul with a very like vapid quote from Kim Kardashian about, you know, makeup brushes or, or something like that and makes an our <laughs> silly juxtaposition. Um, but <laughs> so, so I don't know if it is, I don't know if that's irony or what exactly. Um, but it just, yeah. So what, can you just talk a little bit more about how Kierkegaard fits into these things? Cause I, I really know nothing about him aside from that account. I'm ashamed to say. Uh, I mean, well, he's very helpful when you're trying to, uh, like think about yourself and like how to conduct yourself in the public sphere because he really had his approach to the self is very interesting because he's just like what is it I have no idea like if I am a then I I, am I also b and like the quote I have in the uh, be yourself piece I don't have it with me right now but it's like very you know it's 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 stoner quality but it's also like very when you when you break down the self in such a way you're like oh like i don't really have to be a certain way like there's room for me to do other things i don't have to uh, issue a, a judgment on everything that's happening right yeah and, and that was actually something i, I did want to mention that in the uh, talking about the don't, you know don't be yourself article is that you you bring up the idea that well what is the self maybe there is no self right. and that has like you know both eastern and western philosophical traditions supporting this idea that how can you be yourself if maybe that thing doesn't even exist? Um, and uh, Heidegger, the Nazi philosopher, also like encouraged this type of distance uh, from the self. Like he was like, you only find yourself if you are thinking about your death. So they both kind of encourage this distance from yourself in order to find out who yourself is, it, who yourself are, is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you might be two selves, I don't know. Mm-hmm up to you um so so in your piece can you define earn a little bit more because uh, i mean I, you know we're you know on social media you can kind of build your own you know newspaper or whatever your own feed that you that you see right. so i fi- follow a lot of very ironic people and people mm-hmm. who joke around all the time um and you know like on weird twitter left weird twitter um, so those people, they haven't, you know, they haven't embraced sincerity. They're still on the, <laughs> they're still on the right. Right. irony bandwagon for sure. But then, yeah, there's, there's, so that, but then there's the We Rate Dogs and all sorts of other people who are, you know, posting stuff about their real feelings and, yeah, being very sincere. And sometimes, right. may, maybe sometimes it's a, like, fake sincerity because they just want you to follow them or to, right. like, buy their artwork or something along those right. lines. But, but yeah, so, so, okay, can you talk about how their irony and sincerity have combined? Uh, yes, yeah, so I define earn uh, as urgent earnestness, and it's the kind of thing where you log on and you see someone being like, you know, Trump is a Nazi, like, we must act now. But, like, that's just being said in a tweet, and then, like, nothing is actually happening, just the proclamation of the intention to act or the... Uh, urge to act but then the action uh is never like so tangible so an example i used which is not uh directly that but like the the big women's march in uh january after trump got elected was like totally uh kind of diffuse where there's a lot of infighting and people fighting over what it meant and in the end they didn't really they were just marching because they were women (laughs) and it's like sure I support women but like why are we marching because Mm -hmm. like you know 
this is not to deny the therapeutic aspect of that experience, but it's like if a political action is supposed to uh, lend itself to progress, what is that progress? Like catharsis is not progress. Mm-hmm. Um, so what can, if we, if we return to irony, what, mm-hmm. what can irony, how can irony help the situation? Well, irony would be like, oh, I'm so mad about Trump. So I'm going to like, uh, log off and like go like uh canvas or something or like volunteer or actually like lend bodily sweat to a cause rather than like uh my fingertips so that's more like the like uh the Kierkegaard or uh was it Kierkegaard or Heidegger who you mentioned who has the the distance the philosophical distance from from something well Heidegger's like okay you should just think about how you're gonna die all the time and that will make you so depressed that maybe you'll be spurred into doing something uh worthwhile that's a very rough reading uh and Kierkegaard was basically like maybe just talk about what's happening more instead of like rushing to the streets uh banging pots and pans Mm -hmm. okay yeah Uh, it's it's yeah it's hard to know how you know how people can uh you know affect (laughs) affect change anyway i mean when you're on twitter you feel like you're doing something even though you're mostly right. not doing anything, right. but also like what, like you, you, you know, if you get into a like Twitter war or something with someone else out there, like you're affecting their life and you might be making their day worse or something, but, and you're probably making your own day worse as well. Right. Um, but yeah, not, it's harder. It, you know, there's, there are positive aspects of the platform and social media in general in terms of like organizing and finding out information. But um yeah, it's mostly, mostly you haven't accomplished anything. And, you know, there's just, there's, there's seemingly hundreds of thousands or millions of people on Twitter who feel like they're waging a daily battle. Um, and when they're really accomplishing almost nothing, but, but I guess I don't, I don't see how, is it irony to walk away? I mean, it seems like irony to me would be like sniping from the sidelines and making snide jokes or something, but maybe, or, are there different forms, are we talking about different forms of irony? I mean, I think irony is like a rejection of what becomes the status quo. So after Trump was elected, when everyone, the liberal elite became enraged and like wanting to do something, but not actually doing anything, just appearing like they were doing things like the ironist is like, I'm going to disengage with the tools that these people use to do nothing and either (laughs) go and do nothing in silence or actually do something. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I, there's also like the, yeah, and this is again with like these different kind of shades of what irony means, but you know, because Trump is such a weird, uh, absurd figure and like life has seemingly become so surreal right. um, <laughs> for the past couple of years, it's like, does, you know, what does irony add to that situation? And um, I, had a conversation on this platform that hasn't posted yet with a uh, philosopher who was writing about how, you know, maybe we've worn out satire because like Mm -hmm. social media has made it that uh, you can't tell what's real anymore. Whereas before with satire, there was a level at which you knew it wasn't, it wasn't actually real. Um, But yeah, so it's, I don't know. We live in confusing times. Um, so, yeah, so, okay, well, let's, um, let's shift to the third piece that I want to discuss. Sure. Um, the headline is, can you be a good person if you don't read the news? Um, so, yeah, what, do you, what did you find out? <laughs> What's the uh, answer? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I would encourage people not to read more than one or two news sources a day for, I think it's a public health issue. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I just, a quote that I liked, um, from this is you write, I have come to believe that an essential form of self care is consuming as little national news as possible. And I will argue that this is an ethical choice. So, yeah. So like after Trump was elected, you know, the, the New York times and the Washington post, like their subscriptions went up, you know, maybe like doubled or something yeah. and it's it, people were like this is your patriotic duty if you oppose trump to 
you know, support journalism because Trump opposes, you know, just says right. journalists are the enemy and, and, but also like just to be right. educated and know what's going on. Um, so like that impulse like appeals to me for sure. Um, but there's also like the overload aspect to it that uh, the internet and, and social media provides. Right. Uh, and I think it also is, is problematic because it really puts journalists and journalism on this like insane pedestal. And it's like, well, <laughs> like uh, journalists are not always doing things that are like, so to get information that are so admirable, uh, especially with Trump, it's like reporters who cover him sometimes are like, Oh, he's amazing. Or, so, or like, you know, even leaning that way, uh, no matter what's happening. And uh, I think, and then the people who read it might internalize that kind of bent, which seems wrong to me. <laughs> or like, uh, you know, maybe that's not what you want. So I, I tend to read uh, just the news wires because uh, I like to get information in the most unfiltered state uh, as possible. Uh, so this would be like the Associated Press and Reuters? Yeah, yeah. and um, sorry, I think I lost the thread of the original question. Um, well, I don't even know if there was one. But, um, okay, yeah, so what would you say to someone who feels like, um, you know, they are getting something from, you know, checking Twitter every 15 minutes to see if there's been some new yeah. development? I mean, the Mueller report is over, but that was kind of... A co- like an unspooling story, constant small developments, right. unclear what the import of any of them was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say that there, in general, I would say that a lot of people who are now into news now are not into news before, so that's great, but they should have been into news before uh, instead of just like assuming Obama was doing good things. That's beside the point. Uh, now I would say, like, get a hobby. <laughs> uh, that can like I took up sewing uh, for a while. I was like embroider. Uh, I redownloaded The Sims. Uh, I took I took social media off my phone and I read. Uh, I just had a Kindle app and I read seventy books within like the first few months. Nice. Because uh, like the screens, we feel like we need to be. We want to be looking at them all the time, so you have to give yourself another. Pleasure, pleasure center when you go to them besides, uh, you know, these, these uh, insipid platforms. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, that makes sense. Like getting a hobby. I, 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 when you said that, I thought, oh, but my hobby is Twitter. So that, so that's like, <laughs> that's a, not great. Um, so maybe I should look for something else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I try not to get consumed in the like tribal warfare aspects of I mean, of it's Twitter. Super fun. like, I still enjoy like a good Twitter own or a good Twitter fight. Like it's, it's, there's something like so surreal and funny about it, but it's too dangerous for me to, to go on at any length because I'll just want to be on it forever. Yeah. And so, so why don't we talk about you deciding to, like essentially you lock your account. You, you gave the password to a friend of yours yes. or your, a friend of yours changed the password. And so you, yes. you can't log in yourself. Yes. So why, why did you decide to do that? Uh, I think I just got to a point where I was like, this, this is a compulsion and I don't derive any joy from it. And in fact, it's, uh, it makes me feel bad about myself because like, I'll, tweet what I thought maybe was a funny joke and it will get like one like and I'll be like well I'm a total failure and then you know that's like not a, a great way to measure your life so I was like I'll just like try going off for a month and seeing like what changes uh, but now I'm almost at a year so I'm a year Twitter sober which is wow I never <laughs> I've never heard that phrase before but um, it makes sense in a way yeah it, it definitely is addicting and you get a I assume the, a similar kind of like reinforcement in your brain that like doing drugs gives yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. It's lots of, lots of little, you know, small little, right. Oh, I got to like, Oh, I got to retweet. And I then you follow her. want more and more and you just can't 
you maybe can't get that. And, you know, I, I was just like, I don't want to be tweeting like when I'm 60. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, in a way that's optimistic thinking that Twitter and us will be around, uh, you know, whenever that is 30, 30 years into the future. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I recently um, uh, uh, dropped my phone and broke the screen for the first time ever mm-hmm. in my lifetime of owning a smartphone. Mm-hmm. And that did having to, before I was like, okay, I'll just get the screen fixed. Um, when I was like having to be very ginger with it and move my finger more slowly on the screen mm-hmm. and also being like cognizant of like picking it up and stuff. Mm-hmm. I was, I, I did like seem to develop a more of a distance from the relationship I have with it and yeah. um, how often I was, I was doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, I don't know, you kind of have to like see the, the upsides uh, to not being able to like be available all the time. That's really the thing I like about it most is, no one knows where I am at any time because I'm not literally giving that information away to thousands of people. And I don't <laughs> feel guilty like, like, oh, I haven't gotten to this, this draft yet. I need to get, answer this email. But then I would like tweet like, oh my God, like Real Housewives is crazy. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, they must think I'm so lazy. Like I'm not doing work. Uh, but you don't have Twitter and you're not willingly giving away this information. You can do whatever you want all the time. It's incredible. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So yeah, for you, it really was like cutting the chains and, and experiencing freedom. Um, do you think, um, so, you know, you're, you work in media. I work in media in some way, some way. Um, and a lot of, like there's media Twitter and a lot of people on there and they feel like they have to be on there, even if maybe they don't want to be. Um, but you, so, uh, but you, uh, you know, we talked before you were recently were promoted and um, maybe you're secure enough in your like professional yeah. level that you are yeah. okay. Not having this part. Yeah. I mean, I think it definitely like I'm, I'm absolutely in a privileged position that I'm at a place in my career where I don't need to be like self, promoting all the time maybe if i did it more i would be more successful but i'm kind of happy uh where i'm at and i'm i try to think whether uh not having twitter would have affected me earlier on but i don't think i ever tweeted anything that was good i was never like oh that's a good tweet and someone would see that and want to hire me it's like i don't really think that ever happened and I do find writers over Twitter uh, from time to time, but mostly uh, I don't think it's like that crucial a tool or has not in my, in my career. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it didn't like exist 15 years ago and right. the industry, uh, you know, continued on, but um, yeah. And you, you, I, it's pro- it'd probably be unusual for like a single tweet to like land someone a job or an interview or something. Maybe if you were like a comedy writer and you wrote a really, really funny tweet, right. something right. like, who is this person? Can I have lunch right. with them? Uh, but, they, but you do kind of get like a sense of either who a person is or who are they, they are very good at pretending to be right. online. And then you could be like, well, this is the kind of person I would want to ask to come in for an interview or, so, or something along those lines. Um, so, yeah. So awesome. I don't know. It's like, unless your job is to be good at Twitter, why are you on Twitter all t- the time? Mm-hmm. You have a job? <laughs> right. Yeah. So if you're looking for a social media manager, then you want to look at their Twitter feed. But, um, right. but for other positions, um, maybe not. Um, so there was, a, there was a quote in, in this piece. Uh, you quote a woman named um, Myra Levinson. Um, a professor at Harvard and uh, she says uh, she wrote, so this article came out um, like around June or July last year. Uh, Everybody's a finite amount of cognitive and emotional capacity. And if we spend it on things like horse face instead of climate change, it's actually an unethical use of our cognitive and emotional capacity. So when I was reading, and horse face is linked in your article and I was like, horse face, what what was horse face? Like, like those masks that people like the horse masks that people wear. 
uh, and then I clicked, I clicked on it. I was like, oh yeah, Trump called Stormy Daniels horse face. <laughs> Right, right. And that drove everyone crazy for like 36 hours. Right. But then it had totally, like so many things have happened since then. Right. And it totally exited my mind. Right. And also it was totally, it didn't matter in the least really. Like right. we already knew Trump was a jerk and treated women badly and called them names. So the freak out about that right. um, was a waste of time. Right. And yeah, so the, and, you know, this article was published nine months ago and I didn't even remember what <laughs> that reference was to. So but yeah, and, there, and so there's just things like this constantly going across our screens, and what you know, what is the thing that we're all angry about now that you, you know, one wouldn't even remember six months from now? I don't know. I don't read the news. <laughs> there you go. Um, so do you ever read opinion writing, like uh, the New York Times op-ed page or anything? No, because that that was one of my first jobs. So um, working on that page. So you know, it's like if you work at like a uh, maybe you work at uh, some kind of like fusion restaurant and then afterward you're like I can you come home every day smelling of that food and afterward you're like I can never eat that again <laughs> that's kind of what like okay, was, so you, you saw how the sausage is made it was in- absolutely the most uh of influential experience I've ever had. I learned almost everything I know from working there, uh, but <laughs> not like very, uh, very interesting place. Not, not something I want to continue doing. That's interesting. Um, and since you're not on social media, I guess we cannot discuss the Vanity Fair article about Barry Weiss that <laughs> everyone yeah. was, was talking I about did, yesterday. I did hear about it. Yeah, I did. Well, <laughs> well um, I would say that for anyone who hasn't read that, skip it. It's not worth it. Um, and definitely don't talk about it online. Um, okay, so I think those are, the, those are the three articles I wanted to discuss. So we can't promote your Twitter because you're not really on there anymore. We can still promote it. I mean, I want people to see it and be like, who is that? She's so mysterious. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what is your Twitter handle again? My name, Leah Finnegan. So one word, Leah Finnegan. Yes. Um, and yeah, I, 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 in, like, I'm, so, in, so, I'm like sad for me that you are not on Twitter anymore because you were like an entertaining, uh, interesting presence on there. But for the sake of your own like mental health I and well being, <laughs> definitely, definitely a good thing that you're not on there anymore. Um, I am A R Y E H C W. If anyone wants to uh, follow me, and so you, um, so the out is it theoutline.net or dot com? Dot com outline.com and also is there a url for a for leah letter uh there's a link link in bio at at my twitter page okay cool so and that yeah. link will be will be below um okay so <laughs> anything else you want to plug or anything before uh, we wrap up no i have nothing to plug okay cool um i, I don't either so um so um Thank you, Leah, for coming on and having this interesting, fun conversation. And thank you to all of our viewers and listeners. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you.